Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, here we are with another Soul Seeker podcast. We are going to dive into some interesting and fascinating topics that I've been wanting to unpack for a while. But before we do, let's just go ahead and anchor in with some breath. So if you are driving or doing anything at all where you can't be fully present, well, you can breathe with us, but just don't close your eyes. For the rest of us, let's just go ahead and take a comfortable seat. We'll start to close down the eyes. And just lifting the spine up, sitting straight up, opening the chest, feeling your feet on the floor, and through the nose, inhaling up as you let the belly expand and bring the breath all the way up to the chest. And through the mouth, exhaling, letting the shoulders drop, belly to the spine, letting it out, letting it out. And through the nose, slowly inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top, hold the breath, maybe rolling back the eyes as if you were looking at that third eye space, continuing to hold the breath. And through the mouth, exhaling, letting it go, letting it go, let it out. And last one as we inhale up together, letting the belly expand and bring that prana, that life force energy all the way up to the third eye, sipping in a bit more air at the top, sipping in a bit more, hold the breath, rolling back the eyes, maybe applying a root lock and just allowing yourself to feel. And through the mouth, exhale, let it go, let it go. Letting the breath return to its natural state and rhythm. And just flickering the eyes open when you're ready. All right, here we are. Periscopy, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Sam. Yeah, I'm meeting you at the same time as our listeners are meeting you as well. I, I don't even remember how we got connected, but I know it's through the DMs and Instagram. And you are an expert in bipolar and so many other things. I mean, I love the title of your best-selling book, Crooked Illness. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. If you were meeting someone in an elevator and you only had two minutes to tell them what you're about, how would you describe yourself? I would say that my name is Paris Scobie. I am a mental health speaker, podcast host, and author, and I help people overcome shame connected with living with bipolar disorder. So overcoming that shame, that fear, that isolation that can so often accompany receiving a diagnosis, navigating life with this. So you really feel like you can step into your full authentic self and just live the life you've always imagined for yourself. No more holding on to the pain, the trauma, the hurt that really keeps us so stuck inside of that. I'm all about dismantling the roots of what keeps that self-stigma flourishing to help people overcome that. As I have learned in my journey now, you know, over the last, you know, almost decade or longer um, of my life in, in this area. 
I love it. That's such an amazing mission and alongside what I'm about, just in a different way of going about it or maybe demographic, but I'm all about it. So let's go. What, <laughs> the big question first, and maybe it's an easy question, but what exactly is bipolar? Okay. So I love that you asked that because I actually was wondering the same exact thing before I was diagnosed. And actually when I was even, even when I was younger. So I remember the first time I ever heard about bipolar disorder, I was at a sleepover at a friend's house and a friend was saying that her uncle has bipolar and she said he'll get really happy and excited and then I'll see him running around screaming angry he'll fight with my aunt he'll be super all over the place violent all this stuff so as a kid that was my first encounter with bipolar and then I would see it mentioned in movies and on tv screens people with bipolar disorder and it would be the one of two extremes right people going through depression cycles with that cycling into mania and being up and high so bipolar disorder there's different types of bipolar but I was diagnosed at 19 years old I was hospitalized and diagnosed with bipolar one disorder. There's also bipolar two disorder, cyclothymia, there's unspecified mood disorders as well. But bipolar one disorder is the difference between the two and the different types is that bipolar is, there's an episode that's predominant of mania and being, you know, mania with uh, sometimes psychosis present. So for me, it was, I, I was actually first diagnosed with depression. So many of your listeners might be familiar with that. You know, a lot, a lot more people are more understanding of what does depression mean? What does it look like? So bipolar disorder is a little bit different in that it's depression accompanied by ma mania or hypomania, which is more prevalent in bipolar two disorder, but really kind of feeling like you're never balanced, feeling like you're never living in stability, feeling like you're always constantly going from one extreme to the other was my experience with it at least, but just put it in a nutshell, bipolar disorder is yeah. The, the, when you guys can go on, Google it, look it up, it, you'll see that mentioned, right? The two sides of it. So yeah, but my first experience was it with it. Uh, it wasn't good, and it wasn't good up until not too long ago, actually. <laughs> mm. And yeah, we're going to unpack all of that. So uh, bipolar one is more, more extreme, right? Just to get yeah. So I yeah. So it just is more. You you get a fuller level of that high, like the manic high. Bipolar two is not as it's hypomania. So it's not as like, you don't have like a full blown episode of mania, but you have more, sometimes more of the depression and people I've spoken to, but mm -hmm. bipolar one is for, you have to have at least one episode fully present of full blown uh, manic episode is like what I've seen in myself and a lot of people that I've met. And, and two, you use the word hypomania of how would you describe hypomania? Yeah. So hypomania. So the word hypo, right? Like you look it up, it's like, like lesser, lesser form of that high, right. right? So you're still experiencing mania, but it's not as, you know, typically what you would see in someone with bipolar one disorder, right? Where it's like, for me, at least to give you an example is, um, I remember I would, I, when I was younger, just, you know, being very irritable, elevated, not tired, going days without sleep, very, very high grandiosity feelings mm -hmm. of like, I can't, you know, I can fly or sometimes even having like a lot of paranoia delusions, different things like that. And then almost slipping into psychosis, which was my experience. So that's kind of the difference between the two, I would say is mania versus hypomania. So the, the hypomania almost seems like it would be uh, chronic. Like it's more like ongoing to lesser scale though. Yeah. So I know my, so I actually, my sister was actually diagnosed with bipolar two disorder and that is what, and uh, her experience with that has been more with the depression side of things. And okay. that's a lot of what I've seen and people I've spoken to who have a diagnosis of bipolar two is spending a lot more time in that state, but having tools to overcome so much of the the being stuck in that. Right. But that's really what you see is like, if you talk to someone who says, Hey, like I have a diagnosis of bipolar one versus bipolar two, right. What's the difference. And that's kind of the, the main difference is the level of severity of the, the manic episodes, I would say. Yeah, this is, this is great. I love it because, you know, so often, uh, 
I've found m- myself having these converse- conversations, whether it's just in the past five years or, you know, a lifetime it's similar to you, you know, school. I remember this coming up quite a bit. And it's important that we all get on the same page, understanding what definitions are and mm-hmm. that we're actually like not just hearing it from a friend, like, oh, I think this is it, you know, versus someone who's established like yourself. Mm-hmm. So, to that vein, I'd love to hear from you. What exactly, how would you describe like mania, a manic episode and a psychosis as well? Yeah. So for me, my, my first experience with a manic episode didn't happen until I was 19, actually. So when I was 16 years old, I was actually diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. And I was put on a bunch of different antidepressants. Nothing seemed to work for me. I would have, I would go to therapy. I was, you know, trying to work through a lot of the traumas that I'd experienced. But at the time I was so young, like I was, you know, 15 years old, 16 years old, like, you know, very new to this. I wasn't exactly sure how to even go about opening up about things. So to answer that question, like a lot of my experience and what I've seen in other people living with bipolar is there's a lot of things that we've experienced in our life that we, you know, for me, at least I felt like I couldn't move past. I didn't know how to. And for me, I was 19 when I had my first manic episode and what that looked like to give you a difference is I spent, yeah, 15 years old, 16, 17, 18 living in a very deep, dark depression. So it varied on levels of severity. So there were some days where, you know, I had suicidal ideation I, you know, like had a suicide attempt, self-harm, body image issues, abusive relationships, sexual assault, sexual abuse in different relationships and things like that. But for me, the way that the manic episode presented was I, I remember I was working two jobs at the time. So I was 19. Um, I actually graduated from high school. I was in college. I was about to transition into university. I was in a move from a community, community college to a university And I just noticed such a difference in myself, like uh, such an out of, it it felt like almost out of nowhere. Cause I was like trying to figure out like, where is this coming from? Why am I feeling like I can't slow down? Why am I feeling like I have all this energy? Why am I feeling so irritable and angry and triggered by so many things? And that is when I shortly before I was hospitalized and then diagnose. And what, to answer your other part of your question is psychosis. What is psychosis? What does that mean? So not everybody who is hospitalized or has a diagnosis of bipolar or might suspect that they're dealing with symptoms of bipolar, not everybody has had an experience with psychosis and you don't necessarily, not necessary, but for me, at least it's a complete separation from reality. That's essentially what it is, right? Where you're in a, like when you think about a psychotic episode, what comes to mind, right? Okay. I'm in a very bad place, angry, upset, hurt, feeling such intense emotions, inability to help myself, to take care of myself, to support myself, to support other people. And it's almost can be uncomfortable because you're like, how do I explain this to someone? Like, how do I explain where this came from? Because that's what I would always go back to, but I actually have the answer to that question too. <laughs> now, now I do. <laughs> you have the answer to what the root was, is what you're saying, yes. right? Yeah, that's always important. Yeah, getting back to the root versus just living in that trigger, that panic, for sure. So with this, um, what was I going to ask you? The manic episode psychosis. Oh, I, I remember now. How does one actually get diagnosed? Yeah. So the way that you get diagnosed is you either, so for me, at least I was going to a therapist when I was first diagnosed with depression and they referred me to a psychiatrist. And that's when, and honestly, I can tell you it it's pretty like in my book, I talk about this. So the second chapter, I talk about my misdiagnosis, which was being diagnosed with depression. But at the time, looking back now, it really wasn't a misdiagnosis because I didn't have any experience being in mania or so I didn't have any of that till I was 19 years old. So up until that point, I was, I've only ever experienced so much the symptoms of depression being so overcome by this, not having the tools or resources. So at that time, that is what I was dealing with. 
until I, and this is a very common thing. Like there's a lot of people you'll, you can probably connect with who might say the same thing that they were diagnosed. They were misdiagnosed. They had the wrong diagnosis. They were on, you know, different medications that, you know, didn't help them that made things worse. So that was my experience. And there's a lot of people who are actually first diagnosed with depression prior to receiving this diagnosis. So the way that you go about getting a diagnosis is you, you see a, a psychiatrist is what is how I got my diagnosis, but it was actually in the hospital. So, you know, I was taken to a hospital. I did not want, I, I did not want to be there, but I wanted to get help. I knew something was very, very wrong with me, but I was terrified. I was scared. I was uncomfortable in this place. I didn't feel safe there. And that is actually when I received my diagnosis of bipolar disorder by having a psychiatrist, you know, meet with me, evaluate me, all of that stuff. So that's how it worked, work, how it worked for me. Yeah. The reason why I ask is because it's everything I've ever heard about, it seems to be very subjective, you know, and that makes it very challenging. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that we could get into uh, in this being a subjective thing and especially misdiagnoses as, as well. And I don't know how much, you know, like chemically or scientifically around this, but what's coming up for me is like, is it something that is in you and then gets activated at some point in your life? Or is it something that potentially you may develop at some point in your life, you know? Yeah, that's a really good question because I know this comes up all the time. Like in every, a lot of conversations I have, this comes up a lot is where did this come from for me? Like how, how did bipolar enter my life? Have I always, was I born like this? What, you know, is there a family history of this? You know, was this caused by trauma or a certain event or was it, like you said, activated? Right. And I feel like for me, I know a big event was going, you know, going through a lot of the sexual abuse. And for me, my way of coping with that was very unhealthy. I internalized a lot of it. I didn't talk about it. I would go out, I would party, I would get into, you know, more bad, unhealthy, abusive relationships that continued. And I just didn't know how to get out of it. I knew, I knew I wasn't happy and I knew I was struggling but also the thing about bipolar is it's also tied to shame a lot. It's very connected to shame because I mean, just imagine this, imagine that you are in a doctor's office, right. And you're handed a piece of paper and they're like, Oh, you know, Sam, like you have bipolar disorder and they're like, okay, that's it. You know, you can leave, go take this medicine and come back and see me in like a month. Like, how would you feel about that? Right. And I feel like I had a lot of I was, I was both, I was relieved to tell you the truth. I was relieved because I was like, okay, finally, there's a name to, to what I've been dealing with finally. Cause I actually brought this up to my previous psychiatrist when I was diagnosed with depression. I was like, I don't think I am living with this. I'm like, I know that there's uh, people in my family who have dealt with bipolar disorder. And my doctor was like, Oh, there's no way you have that. He was like, you are, you know, you're working two jobs, you're getting straight A's in school. You, you know, you have this relationship. Basically he was telling me that I look great on paper. I'm not in like, a, I'm not a train wreck. So therefore like you, you don't have this. So, I mean, my, my, uh, diagnosis, it came from literally me having a, a breakdown moment where I was in a psychotic episode manic. And I was literally taken to a place to be evaluated, then hospitalized, and then diagnosed. Would you be open to sharing what that manic episode looked like? Yeah. So for me at the time, so it's, I always say this, like there's so much that I do remember, but there's also a lot that I don't. There's a lot of memories that I'm like, I try to put the pieces together. Like what, what happened during this time? But to give you a, a, a glimpse into what that looked like for me, it just, I just felt that day, like prior to the day that I was taken to the facility um, and then hospitalized. I remember that whole entire day. I, I actually called 911 nine times throughout the day. And I didn't know, I had, I didn't know this. I knew that I was, you know, calling, but I remember later when the police, like they were at my, my house with my parents and they're like, do you, do you realize your daughter has called this number nine times today? Like they were like saying this. And I remember just, I just felt like 
I was like, no one believes me, you know, cause I brought this up before and I, I was always told, I was always dismissed basically. So basically what I mean is like, I'm bringing up, uh, this isn't normal to be, you know, working two jobs. I'm not tired. I'm always going out and partying. I'm just, I have all this energy. I'm so angry. I'm so like, it was so many emotions and feelings and pain, like all at once. But I was just told, no, like, like, you know, like I just was, you know, constantly dismissed. And I feel like I was also dismissing myself mm -hmm. as well, because I was saying all this to my doctors in a therapy, but then in real life to people who knew me face to face, I was like, everything's great. Like no one knew what was going on. Like every, like people were so shocked when I told them years later, I was like, yeah, I was actually hospitalized and like, uh, you know, <laughs> suicidal. I wasn't doing well. I was really struggling and people had a, a hard time believing that because I didn't show that side of myself to the world. Cause I didn't want to, I was afraid that I would scare people. I was afraid that I would worry people who cared about me and loved me. And I just thought it would go away. I was like, this will just go away on its own. And it didn't. <laughs> well, yeah, right. I mean, at the time, like you didn't know there was something else there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when we're partying and we're drinking and we're 19 years old and you know, whatever, all of that, it's like, and even looking back to a certain extent too, we can be like, well, you're working two jobs, you're going to school and you're, you're raging, you know, like mm -hmm. that makes sense. You feel like shit, right. You know, right. but it's so much deeper than that. It, it seems like it's a common theme for a lot of people that have are living with bipolar to kind of hide that and wear this mask of false positivity. Could you speak to that a bit? Yeah. So to speak to that, I think I've, I've talked to so many people who have shared a similar thing of, I would wear this mask and try to hide it because I felt like I had to, I felt like, and I, I think to put it in three buckets to break it down, a lot of the, what I've seen in the work that I do is there's these three things that come into play. So it's shame, fear, and isolation. That is what feeds you know, myself and others who have a diagnosis of feeling like I can't share this. I can't talk about this. And the worst part, I can't seek help for this. And I'm just left to do it on my own and it'll go away. And, but it doesn't. So I can speak to that because for my experience, at least I remember coming home from the hospital, I would, I was in a class in one of my college classes. And I remember being very open and saying, yeah, like I, just got home. I was in a hospital for two weeks. I got this diagnosis. And I remember I felt so uncomfortable and I felt free, but then I also had a lot of bad experiences where I would have people be like, so that means you're crazy or psychotic, or did you want to, did you try to kill yourself? Did you try to kill people? And there were so many questions and like things that were coming out and thrown at me that I was like, dang, like maybe I shouldn't talk about this. I was like, maybe this is just like, just uncomfortable. This is just too weird. Like maybe I, and it actually ended up hurting me because I felt like something was inherently wrong with me as a person that like caused me to have this label, right? Like, why do I, why was I given this diagnosis? What does this mean? And I, I would always question it. And that is where that mask came into play because I felt like, okay, cool. Like I can hide this. Like I don't need to share it, but it was so exhausting. It was so tiring. Cause I'm like, I'm not authentically myself. And an example of that is you guys, I was hospitalized at 19 diagnosed, got my, came home and I ended up graduating from college. And I actually went back and I worked at the same exact hospital where I got my diagnosis at, where I was a patient at. And I felt so happy. I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to be able to help people who've struggled in similar ways to myself. But you know what happened instead? I actually felt like I was an imposter. Like I didn't belong there. Like I tricked the system. I was constantly telling myself what would happen if these people found out that I was a patient here, this, this isn't going to work. And I was, I literally had a wake up moment where I was like, I am never going to be able to, to overcome this. I'm never going to be able to live the life that I want unless I free myself of this. And I be honest and I be real. And that's when I started my podcast. Hmm. <laughs> wow. How long ago was that? 
four and a half years ago. There we go. Yeah, because what comes up for me when I hear you say that is like, if I were to put myself in, in the seat of someone that were was at that hospital experiencing bipolar, and then I see you like on quote unquote, the other side and like the healing side, helping people, I'd be like, wow, that gives me so much hope, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I think that's, that's what I was excited to do, but that didn't come until I was able to, to actually speak about it and to say, and then I remember it was, it was February of 2020 is when, and the very, it's so funny. The very first episode of my podcast, you can literally go back and listen. It's you hear rocks crunching in the background. That's how like, that's how new and beginner I can tell you I was. I literally downloads app. And I was like, all I knew was that I had a message in my heart that I ha I'm like, I have to share this because for one, it's going to help me. And then it's going to help other people. And I'm never going to be able to get to the number two of helping other people unless I help myself because I, I need to start with that. So I just, I, I started and I, I started talking about the relationship between mental and physical health. And then I got done recording and I remember looking at my phone and I was like, shit, I'm like, I need to like name the episode. I need to have a name for the podcast. I, and like, I was like, I don't know any of this. I don't know marketing. I don't know my low, like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't, this, it felt so consuming, but I'm like, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to call the podcast crooked illness. Cause that's my book that I'm working on. And I'm going to call it the relationship between mental and physical health. And I'll just figure out the rest later. And that's what I did. I hit publish. I sh shared it out to all my friends and people I knew. And honestly, I can tell you the truth. This is the message that I want to like really leave you guys with. If you take away anything from this podcast is start before you're ready. You do not need to know all the answers and you actually won't. You won't because you know, as you continue to do something and especially in my, in my journey, right. Navigating life with bipolar, I'm still learning so much. Like every day I meet somebody and they tell me their story and I'm like, holy shit. Like I never even thought about that or knew about this as a resource. Like that's the beautiful thing, but you, I would never, that's the, the funny thing is I would have never had the opportunity to connect with you and share my story with you to help your audience and your listeners. Had I not started with myself and been like, I am so scared right now. I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I don't feel like I know how to be a podcaster, but I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to do it anyway. And that's what I did. I love that. And that's it's such a great entrepreneurial spirit. And I, I credit my dad for that in me. I, I, he's really ingrained in me like to just go, just do it and figure it out as you go along. And so much so when I launched my first podcast with a homie in 2017, January 17th, 2017, day before my dad's birthday, that's how I remember it. It was like that scene in Zoolander where they're like, the <laughs> files are inside the computer and they're like, hoo, 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 you know, like they're trying in, like we, we had no yeah. idea what we were doing but then i end up listening to a podcast on how to podcast going the national podcast conference and all the things and that's really how you get you take action you figure out along the way so i'd love that you're bringing that to the table here so in on this theme of taking action and realizing that like we're always learning you know so many get, people get caught up in narcissistic type behaviors where they think like oh i've made it and i know everything there is to know about certain things are there any links between bipolar and narcissistic tendencies yeah, that's a really good question because that is the case actually. So I've heard a lot about that from people that I know who tell me that they have a loved one who's been diagnosed. So I actually had a friend actually, before I got on this podcast, um, a friend of mine reached out to me and she was like, Hey, like my mom's bipolar and we don't have a relationship because she uses it as like, she throws it in my face all the time. She'll tell me like, I can't do this or I can't talk because I'm bipolar. And she's like, it just bothers me because I feel like I can't connect with her and we don't have this relationship. And I feel like it's always about her and like, and all that stuff. So I've heard that a lot actually from people. I would definitely say, you know, again, like I'm not a doctor or anything, but like, I'm a person with like, who's lived experience with this. I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, but I would say for me, at least I definitely for sure can say I've, I've seen signs of that even in myself when I was younger, for sure. I was definitely like when I was younger, before I actually started doing the work on myself, 
to take care of myself, to learn the tools, to learn the resources. I was in hardcore denial mode. And part of that mask, that facade, there was definitely narcissism that fueled that because I would tell myself, I'm so great at X, Y, and Z. And I would like almost kind of brainwash myself in a way by mm. being like, I'm so great at these things that I can, I can like make this my life or whatever. Right. But I was neglecting my real human self in my existence by almost like, a, almost like emotionally abusing my own self by being like, like when you, when you hear about people who've been in relationships with people who have you know, whether or not they have a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder, but I've definitely been in relationships with people like that. But also I have been the person who've had those characteristics as well. And I've had to work on that. I've had to face it. And, you know, it cannot always, it, it's not always easy to admit to these things because it's who wants, who wants to say that, right? Who wants mm -hmm. to say, oh yeah, I'm a narcissist or like, you know, I have care, like no one, right? But I think when we can, when we can look at ourselves, and see what parts of ourselves are in pain. Where, what part of our inner child are we neglecting? And what part of our existence are we holding ourselves back from, from actually being able to show up for other people? And that's a lot of the, the, the deep work that I did over the years that really allowed me to like look back on my life and be like, dang, like I've been through a lot of shit, but I've also not been the best person to other people too. So mm. it goes both ways. That's huge. And, you know, it's, it's gi giving ourselves for forgiveness towards ourselves. You know, I think so often we uh, look external. I mean, we can think about a meditation. How many times do we meditate and our eyes are closed and we tell ourselves we're meditating, but if we we're to really think about it, like our gaze is 10 feet in front of us versus that inch right in front of us. And it's the same thing when we evaluate things, we look at other people versus looking at ourselves and being vulnerable with that. And the reason why I asked that is I've done a little bit of research on um, narcissists and a little bit about bipolar or not a ton, but I, I came across uh, both of these, I'd say decent amount, uh, something called CSS, Central Sensitivation Syndrome. Have you heard of that? So what? Is, so you said it's called, what is the acronym? CSS. Central. What, Sensitivation I, Syndrome. I have not heard that actually. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And um, just to share my my personal relationship to all this, um, you know, I, I'm i not one who likes to label other people. So I do try at least in my head and the best I can with my communication, say like exhibiting, you know, XYZ type behavior versus mm -hmm. is a, you know, I don't think we should work with labels, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think that is actually when a lot of the damage comes in when bipolar's in like the arena, because especially if you get a diagnosis or you're told that, right. Maybe say you go to, you get a diagnosis from a doctor or maybe say that you are in a relationship and the person that you're in a relationship is like, I think you're bipolar or you're acting bipolar. I think that also language is so powerful. So I always tell people like, especially people who aren't as educated on bipolar disorder. I think that's great. If they're, if like, I feel like, I mean, even you are an example. Cause I remember we were talking and you were like, you were like, I, I haven't been diagnosed with this. I don't know a lot about it. Like how you were asking me questions. And I was like, these are excellent questions that I could totally answer and walk through on the recording. Cause I feel like there's probably so many people just like you who want to learn more about it. Right. But they mm -hmm. haven't either had that experience. They don't have too much exposure to it. So having someone like me who lives it, who's lived this, this life with it, right. I can share, here's how it looks. And, but then also here's how it manifests in, you know, 200 plus interviews that I've done over the last four years and other people. So, so yeah, I think uh, that to your point is definitely important is really just like, what is bipolar? Where does it come from? How does it show up? But then also what I do on the podcast is what does it mean to live well bipolar? What are you doing right now? that has helped you get to where you are because it's about giving that back to someone else who might be sitting there feeling like they have nothing. I have nothing right now. So yeah. how do we break that down? And I want to get there uh, as well. I just have so many preliminary questions. Okay. You know? <laughs> and and it, it's funny too, because like I have a, a 
someone in my life who was recently diagnosed with um, ADHD and the way that that came about was um, this person mentioning it like they couldn't do something or it was because of their ADHD. And I looked at them and I was like, someone I know pretty well, I'm like, you don't have ADHD. Who told you that? <laughs> like, I, know. I, I, I know you pretty well, you don't have ADHD. And then I did mm -hmm. some, some research afterwards and it was like, what? No, you, that person definitely does not. So th that's part of the labels and to your point of your friend with her mom and her mm -hmm. mom saying, I can't do this. And like, we start to identify that. So to that mm -hmm. point, I've been curious for myself for quite some t time, probably since like junior high age, I was like, am I bipolar? You know, mm -hmm. and in the recent, um, past year, as I go deeper down narcissistic type behaviors, I'm like, am I the narcissist? And then mm. I have my friends being like, the fact that you're asking if you're the narcissist <laughs> means you're not. And I'm like, I, I can't receive that. I'm like, yeah, no, that seems a little bit spiritually bypassing, you know, like to a certain <laughs> yeah. extent, like I, I, I could get down with that. And I understand that. But at the same time, I'm like, there's just some things that have happened. And I think the broader topic that we're talking about here is like you know the fact that you were diagnosed with bipolar at 19 there were yeah. signs before misdiagnosed like these labels almost tend to keep us uh, constricted and they're hurting us because you might have that one day but it's not always that way you know what i'm saying mm, yeah so i think for me like the way that i i talk about it is i think once you receive the diagnosis like i feel like for me i felt i was hopeful. Okay. I was like, okay, at least I have this. I can figure out how to like move forward. But I was also, I also felt that as well. I also felt a lot of the shame and the stigma in the label, but I feel like the way that I talk, identify with it now is this is literally just one part of my human experience. Like this is one part of my life because that's the thing is when you think about it, there are so many labels and things in life that can carry a negative connotation. Right. So, I mean, for say, for example, like you were like, oh, like I come from a divorced household or my parents are divorced. Divorce, like, you know, that's a, oh, you're getting a divorce. Like what happened? Like what's wrong with you? Why couldn't you work on your marriage? That's a stigma. Or even saying, you know, there's stigmas with sexuality even still to this day. Like someone who's, who's saying, hey, like I'm going to come out and share that I identify as, you know, I'm, this is what I identify as, right? I mean, people can throw like names at you, like, oh, you're gay or like, you know, all those names, right? There's a negative connotation behind that. There's a negative connotation again, behind mental illness. But I feel like for me, the way that I look at it is I'm actually so thankful for all my experiences, even the, sh the most disgusting, like ho most horrible ones, because that ha has allowed me to see the lessons, like this is what it taught me about myself. This is what it showed me that I was lacking or how I was hurting myself. And having that diagnosis of bipolar, now I feel like I am so good at my routine, self-care, knowing how to show up for myself. I've cultivated such a good support network and I've done so much over the years. But I think again, like knowing that I've completely freed myself of that label because I think, and I think I might be like a little bit of a unique case because it's like what I do right professionally for work. Like the, like literally how can you get more clear than that? Like my podcast is live well bipolar. It's in the name, like it's literally there. So live well bipolar. I'm very open to everything in my book. Like what I do with speaking, like people who know me, they're like, Oh yeah, Paris bi bipolar advocate. Like, so I feel like I have kind of, I guess like you could say like twisted the, the way that people perceive it to be, this is something that I've gone through. This is something I've experienced, but it also gives me insight into what I need to do to take care of myself that I was never doing before. And also still to this day, I still have moments where I will slip and I will fall and I will deal with, with shit if I am not doing the things that have gotten me to this place. So I think like there's, and again, like I'm a pretty unique case, but I feel like I have helped what I think with the label that I, that I think I can tell you is I've gotten people, uh, there was a guy who emailed me actually. So he's like 65 years old. And he said, Hey, like I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I haven't 
I haven't ever been able to like tell a lot of people or, or really deal with this. You know, it's followed me forever. And like you basically what you're saying, right? How that label can kind of hit you. And you're like, I was told bipolar. And it's like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. So he said, I just want to tell you that you're my hero because mm. I've been listening to you. And I was like, I was like about to cry, like sitting there. Re He's like, I just want to tell you that you're my hero. Like I've been listening to your podcast. Like your book has helped me so much because he's like, I never thought that I would, I would have a moment in my life where I feel like I can actually confidently talk about this and seek help and share this with people that I love. And also he said, he's like, separate myself from it. Like it's not my identity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important thing for people to understand is like, you know, yes, I, I have received this diagnosis, but this isn't like everything, you know, and there's things that I told myself, there's lies that I have an episode on this, like lies that bipolar told me. Like one of those, I can tell you one of them for sure was I will never be able to find a loving and supportive partner. And mm. I have been married for over uh, a year. Right. And again, like that came, that would have never happened. Had I not freed myself, had I not done the work and, you know, had I not been able to overcome this, but there's so many things that bipolar disorder and we let like mental illness like hold us back. And like a lot of it is us. Like we're the ones putting those obstacles in front of ourselves and saying, because I have bipolar, I cannot have this career because I have bipolar. I cannot be an entrepreneur or launch my business or scale my business because I have bipolar. I'm never going to be a father or a mother. I can't have kids. I shouldn't have kids. You know, I'm a bad person. There's so many of these things, but honestly, it's just separating yourself and getting to know who are you, right? I know you've been given this name or this label, but like, who is Sam as a person, right? That's what we want to uncover. I love all that so much. And I definitely want to get into the relationship piece. I can think back to times in my life when I've Googled, like, you know, how to be in a relationship with uh, someone that is bipolar. And if you Google anything to that <laughs> extent, it's pretty much going to be like, you're screwed. You're uh, get out of the relationship as soon as possible, which I, I remember going down those rabbit holes and being like, what? No, <laughs> like that's impossible. So I would love to get to that place to ask you about your relationship a little bit, but a few more things to close the loop on the CSS central sensitization syndrome. So here's the thing. The reason why I bring that up is because if we're feeling that we can't take off the mask because of societal norms and conditioning, or maybe how we feel about ourselves as a result or chicken or the egg, whatever the case may be, then what happens is the body is responding to our emotions emotional and mental state, as you know. So mm -hmm. CSS is basically talking about how your body will get to into dis-ease. One of those being the mystery dis-ease of fibromyalgia, which is mm -hmm. basically the body shutting down to get your attention. And as I started to research at CSS, this all came in as like a download. So I started to like Google the things that I was specifically looking for is that CSS is linked to bipolar and narcissistic type behaviors as well. So it's like when mm. those two are married together and you're shoving it down and not willing to accept it, that's when mm. the body starts to fail and it says, Hey, Hey, we're trying to get your attention here. So the work that you're doing Paris is so incredible and I love it so much. So thank you Aww. for that. Yeah, no, thank you so much for those kind words. It means a lot to me because exactly what you're saying is like, I remember the, like how long I feel like I spent living in that and feeling like I couldn't be my real self. I couldn't overcome this. I would, I was stuck when really a lot of it, come, you know what it came down to? It came down to my environment, my habits, my thinking, my relationships, what I'm consuming, what I'm consuming food wise, media wise, so many things in my life. I am a completely different person than I was 10 years ago. Uh, and a lot of it was, I can get into like the changes I made, but I, I love that because I mean, honestly, like I, I never thought that I would be able to, to say that out loud. I never thought that I would be able to confidently say, I got this diagnosis of bipolar, but here's what it taught me. And here's what it, here's what it helped me overcome. And here's what I still do to this day to have a good quality of life instead of being so stuck in that struggle. And so overcome by that, where I cannot get out of this negative thought spiral. So yeah, so so I really appreciate that. 
Hell yeah. So if people can go to your podcast, your book, your work, so much, all of that stuff to find out like the specific things that you would recommend if you're someone who identifies as being bipolar and what mm -hmm. you can do. But it sounds like the number one thing would be the typical personal development, spiritual development type modalities that we would think of alongside the shadow work of accepting and surrendering to this as opposed to shoving it down on a very high level. Would you say that's, that's it? Yeah, I would agree because I feel like I actually have a free resource as well that you could probably link in the show notes for your audience. I have a free workbook that I put together for you guys. If you would want, if you want to download it, I have a, it's a bipolar wellness workbook. And then I also have a self-care guide as well. So if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't have bipolar, so that doesn't apply to me, then you could access the other one. So that one is a free, complete breakdown of how to do that. But just like you said, yes, it's investigating those parts, the shadow work, the, the sides of ourselves that maybe we push away, we hide, we feel like we need to run away from. And honestly, a lot of it is in, just basically for me, honestly, like it started with just get sitting down, getting a piece of paper out and just writing out habits, thoughts, relationships, just all these words and then filling it up. Like who, who are people in my life? Who are my relationships? What kind of thoughts do I commonly have in my head? Like, what are those nasty negative thoughts that come up? What are my habits, right? Like, do I read, do I listen to podcasts? Do I move my body or do I spend all my time going out partying and like getting drunk and wasted and like me meeting people online? Like, what am I actually doing? And then also classifying that, right? So we can classify these things based on, is this helping me? Is this hurting me? And then also classify it based on what can I actually control? Because I feel like, especially with bipolar, we feel so out of control. Mm. We feel stuck. We feel lost. We feel like, you know, maybe I've tried X, Y, Z medication. Maybe I've tried all these therapists. Maybe I've tried all these healing modalities and nothing is working for me. So we feel defeated. We feel stuck and lost. And that further, you know, brings forth the shame and, you know, feeling like that. So when someone um, is feeling that way and they have bipolar that uh, when I say feeling that way, like they, they can't have control for someone that is in resistance, would you say that tends to lend itself to having a more controlling personality then? It can, but I think it also depends on the person, right? Also like the circumstances, like what are they? Like, basically it comes down to like your view on control versus can't control. So for me, I can give you an example. So in the past, when I was really, really, really just, I was not open about this. I wasn't who I am today. So I felt like I could not control my environment. I could not control my thoughts. I could not control my relationships. The only thing I thought I could control was getting out of bed. And I put my feet on the ground, I woke up. And now I'm like, actually, I can control my environment. I can control my relationships. I can't, and you, you can control your, your thoughts as well with, you know, working through conditioning, but still you're, of course, you're still going to have days where you will be in a slump. Life will hit you with something that was unexpected and you will go down and go through all these different things. But there are things that we can do like saying, you know, an example I can give you is a lot of the abusive relationships I was in. I felt like that. I really felt that I was undeserving of love. Something was wrong with me. And this is the best that I will get. And that is pretty sad because that's, that's how I, that's what I would tell myself. Yeah. And then uh, in terms of the subconscious mind and creating your reality, you're getting that it's, it's everything is a yes. And, and looking at all how everything's interconnected and what's coming up for me too, as well as like astrology, you know, being mm. in sync with new moons, full moons and anything else, uh, retrogrades, all that kind of stuff. So, and human design, there's so many different things that we can pull at. And, you know, it's a shame because from where I'm sitting, learning about this more, it's like, all right, I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, I don't have <laughs> any sort of schooling like that at all, but just taking it being like, that's a subjective type thing and that we're checking boxes. 
I would say that I'm bipolar and most of the people I work with are bipolar. And right. I think, it, and I think I could even go so far as say that most of the population, at least here in America is, and we are so disconnected from ourselves. And, you know, the Indian philosophy would talk about it as Maya or Native American would talk about it as a uh, Watiko, the mind mm -hmm. virus of the illusion of separation. And from that point of view, I'm like, it kind of feels like a lot of us actually are living with, with bipolar and be so easy to just jot that down and here you go, mm -hmm. have some pills, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of the issue because there's a lot of people. And I, and I mean, the problem with that too, is like the misdiagnosis thing, because I mean, it's very dangerous. I mean, especially with a lot of people who actually are living with bipolar, a lot of them have been told they have depression or anxiety. Like there's all these things that are out there, but I think it's, it's like you said, it's so individual and that's why it's so important because I feel like there's so many people, you can go to a psychiatrist or a therapist right now, right? And maybe do a couple appointments and they might say, oh, yep, you know, you're bipolar. Or, oh, yep, and, uh, you're this. Pause real quick. This when I'm saying this, and I think when you're saying this too, we'd be talking about bipolar two, where there's not a manic episode tied to it, correct? Right, right. Uh, yeah. So, and I think that the issue with that is, Everyone is so individual, but I also think it comes down to if you're, when you're given a diagnosis like that, you know, it is not the end of the world, but it, it can definitely feel like that. And I, and I understand why, because I mean, if you look at society in general, like you said, when you go on Google and you type, you literally said that when you type in Google, you know, how do I date someone with bipolar? Oh, get out of the relationship. It's never going to work. Like I've, I've actually had people tell me there was a woman that I know and she told me, she said, I wish that I knew you 10 years ago. Cause that probably would have saved my marriage because she said, my husband is bipolar and we got a divorce. And she mm -hmm. said, I just could not deal. Like it was just a mess. Couldn't deal with it. And she said, but I feel like if I knew you and I, you know, we, we possibly could have like worked through this. Right. And I feel like that's the thing is like, it's so individual, but then it's also so individual on what that person needs, but then also how do they treat themselves? Like, how do you actually treat yourself? And do you feel like, and I, again, like you probably heard this, this thing of the mindset of I'm the victim or the victor, mm -hmm. you can be the victor of your life or the victim and say, this happened to me, everything's over. It sucks. And that again, and again, another thing is invalidating our own traumas. Like we, we can often do that too. So maybe we go through something like I did. Right. And I can, I literally would tell myself, I was like, this really wasn't that bad. It could have been worse. I could have been killed. You know, it wasn't, you know, and then I would, and then I would try to tell myself that it didn't even happen. I would basically try to like brainwash mm. myself into like, this wasn't even real. So again, we do stuff like that to ourselves that makes it even worse. Right. So there's so much that goes into it, but I think when we're talking about bipolar, just like anything else in life, right. You can live, you can have such a good quality of life and do all the things you want to, as long as you get a good picture of where are you at right now? Where have you been before? And where are you hoping to go? And you can craft craft how that would look. Okay, so what's coming up for me now is like, what are some of the things that would trigger activate a manic episode? Yeah, so I know it's very different for a lot of people, but I can I can speak to my own experience. So for me, um, for me, I can tell you what I, what triggered my, my manic episode that I went into psychosis. I was hospitalized, very severe. It was ignoring it. It was stuffing it down. It was, I'm, it, this isn't real. I don't, cause I remember I even brought it up. I said, I think I'm living with bipolar. And I was told, no, you don't have that. My, my like, cause I feel like if you're told that by a doctor, right. You right, believe yeah. it. You're like, Oh, this doctor said, I don't, so I don't have it. So I would, I would mask it. I would hide it. And I feel like when you ignore something for so long, when you try to cover it up and just think it'll go away, your body will actually shut down eventually. Either CSS, meant, yeah. yeah. So your body, your mind, and you will be faced to deal with it. So that's really what my experience was with it is it was a lot of denial and this isn't real and I'm, you know, living in shame. And then when I finally said, you know what? I have been given this diagnosis and I can either continue to like, I am going to be unkind to myself or I can just start learning about it. And that's what I did. That's, I literally was like, I am going to share my story. I'm going to meet other people around the world who also have this diagnosis and I'm going to do something about it. And that's, I think what separates me from a lot of people 
because I said, you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm like, I'm going to be my real, true, authentic self and my real, true, authentic self. There's a lot of labels that we have, right? I mean, just at the beginning of this episode, some of my labels are, you know, like many of us have, right? I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm an author, a podcaster, a speaker, all these things. But basically all of us have labels that let us know that we mean some, we mean something to someone and someone else means something to us. So why can't we treat ourselves like that? Why can't we value ourselves the same way we might value our mom, dad, husband, wife, whoever, whoever it is for you, right? So it just comes down to separating, like, I mean, any of those labels, right? You know, you could say, oh, my, this person's divorced or they're going through, you know, maybe they're, they're gay, right? Or they're, you know, they're whatever, right? Because I think there's so many things that people say that, oh, like, you know, I feel like it's like, if you tell someone, I mean, if you have a friend, you're like, oh, like, have you ever thought like maybe you, you're dealing with bipolar? I'm like, oh, no, I'm never, I would never be bipolar. I, that makes no sense. Or if you, ha- or if you're like, you know, someone's questioning like, oh, like, you know, I think I might be gay. I don't know. I'm, I'm questioning my sexuality, right? There could be shame with that. Other people can shame you or you can shame yourself. So it goes both ways, but I think it's all in how we, how we see it and what we do to help ourselves through life in a way that is, you know, successful and giving, giving ourselves grace and being kind to ourselves. Yeah, we're living in such an interesting time because like right now you mentioned um, like gay, right? A few yeah. times. And, and, you know, I'm 36. You're probably about the same age, give 29. or 29. Yeah, it's a, close enough, right? So we probably both grew up in the era of like, that's so gay or you're gay, right? But Right. And it doesn't like, at least maybe it's that I'm older and maybe it's that I'm not around kids, but I, I am around like my friend's kids enough to kind of have a sense and i don't think that's in their dialect anymore to say that and i feel like it's the same thing maybe not the same thing but it's a similar category of you know bipolar or this or that where we're releasing the stigma around it just yesterday i had a um uh, nurse practitioner of 30 years in uh, neurosurgery on the podcast. And he was talking about the default mode network in the brain and how, when you hear something that triggers the default mode network and that shuts down the frontal lobe and the frontal mm-hmm. lobe is like the decision-making, right? So immediately mm-hmm. we just go on a subconscious level level into that primal state of associating it with something else. Because to your point, like if I had a friend say to me like, Hey, Sam, like, think you might be bipolar my first reaction would be like what the fuck you know yeah. like what are you trying to say about me like what and I even had a friend that gently like you know kind of said that I might be autistic you know mm. and I could feel those feelings arise in me but at the same time doing this deep spiritual work I'm like no thank you and I appreciate us having an open conversation about mm-hmm. this but if you're not doing the work you won't have that because right now it's easy to get into that place of that ego reaction of that Mm -hmm. programming and then be like, wait, 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 that's not actually me. That's the programming. I'm going to step away from that. So this lends itself into the conversation of navigating relationships, because what I would imagine is if you're in a relationship, we could call it a, a romantic, romantic or platonic relationship. So parent, uh, child or spouse or partner, whatever. It seems that the person with bipolar, but maybe both parties would need to be quote unquote, doing the work for it to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. So, I mean, I can even tell you like in terms of my relationships with my parents and my husband. So when I first met my husband, we actually met each other. It'll be six years of when we first met. Like we met like August 11th of 2018. So we got married last year. So married for almost a year and a half now, but I can tell you that's so true because when I met him, I was so scared, like to tell him like, Hey, this is my story. Here's what I've been navigating. Cause, and also what's really cool is I actually met him before I had my podcast, before I wrote my book, before, before anything, I was, I was new out of college, navigating life, like all this stuff. So he was one of the earlier people that I had told all of this to. And he actually, like I, in my mind, I was like, I'm going to tell him this. 
and he's never going to want to date me anymore. He's going to think I'm crazy. He's going to leave me. And I was like, that's awesome. And I was happy because I'm like, he's too good for me. Because again, that goes back to me thinking I'm undeserving of love. So if I feel that way, I'm going to try to push it away. I'm going to try to self-sabotage it. So I remember telling him this and he was like, I literally recorded an episode about this. So if you guys actually want to hear like the full, I actually interviewed my husband. So I got like a lot of questions. So I I'm interviewed put him. that in the show notes. What number is that? Yeah. So I can, I think it's, I'll, have send, to, I'll send it to guys. You. It's in the yeah. show notes. Yeah. The show notes for the episode. So I interviewed my husband. I actually asked because a lot of people were at, like, they want to know, like, how do you navigate this? Like, what is he, what has he done for you? How do you support each other? So he actually was the one from the beginning who was like, I think you should, share this. I think you should start your podcast. I think you should share. Like he was very encouraging. And I can tell you that is a huge part of my stability, my success in life is having a life partner who is committed also to learning about this, right. To like doing research, to also asking me questions like, Hey, what did your past look like? Or also, also I, what I love too, is like when he calls things out, in me or he'll bring up things and he'll say, Hey, like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I've been noticing, you know, like in the past, he's like, you haven't been sleeping a lot. Like, is everything okay? Like I'm, and I feel like in the beginning I would get kind of triggered and get mad. I'd be like, what do you mean? Like, what, what are you trying to say? But then, like you said, I released the ego and I was like, he's just trying to help. So I was like, Oh, so again, like very supportive partner is huge, especially with, you know, living with a diagnosis of bipolar is, is everything. Cause I've had very abusive relationships where I have told people that I was with, I'm living with bipolar and they literally have turned around. And I remember one guy was like, I'm going to tell my whole family and you know, like, I'm going to tell everyone about this. And like, you know, like he was like threatening me with it almost. So again, that made me more scared again. Like, why would you like, again, like that's pretty, that's pretty sad. Like I'm trying to share with you something and you're like, I'm going to tell everyone about it and you can't drink and all this stuff. And like, all, like all this thing, all these things. But again, like my relationship with my parents, I had a lot of trauma with my relationship with my mom that I've been able, I've been thankfully able to heal through a lot of years of therapy. And that also would not have happened had I not committed to doing the work. So like you're saying, it goes both ways, right? So my husband committing to being with me, committing to having a life, committing to marrying me, you know, and, and that's what it is, is, is me also telling him that there's things that I'm afraid of. Right. I mean, even still to this day, like I'm, I still have fears of like, you know, we want to start a family in the future. Right. Like, what does that look like? You know, how, how is that going to, what, what are the questions that can come up for me? Right. So I think it just, it's, it goes both ways of the person who's, who has a diagnosis being willing to do the work and then also their partner or husband or father, mom, whoever in their life being that supportive person as well. Amazing. Thank you for that. Final question. So how do you work with this person? If they're, how do you hold space uh, for this person and navigate the relationship if they're not willing to do the work? Yes. So if they're not willing to do the work, I have seen that happen where the example I gave you, like the woman right. who was like, I got a divorce. So again, like it is very difficult and I will tell you, and I, I don't have too much experience with that personally, because I just, I know that if I didn't do the work and I don't, things will fall apart for me. I just know that. And I can tell you that because I was the person in the past who did not want to do the work. I didn't think I needed to. I didn't think it had anything to do with me. I thought the world was against me. I thought that I was, I was hurt by all these different things that I'd gone through, which I was, but I also wasn't willing to take accountability for what can I do to move forward? So it goes both ways. So I can tell you, like, I think it would be very difficult to have a successful relationship with someone if they, if the person who's living with bipolar is like, no. Like, and I, I think a big thing is it comes with dismissing it. Like, no, I don't have that. That's not me. Mm -hmm. So let go of that. I think that's the first step. Like, let, like, this is, this is nothing that is signaling that you are a defective human being. It is just telling you that you have gone through these things. You have these symptoms that are showing up. You have these experiences. It's basically see it as a way to look into the resources to help but I think it would be very hard 
to maintain a relationship if that person, and I think it comes, that person needs help. That's what it is. Like they're, they need help, but they're afraid to seek it and ask for it because of the shame. So we need to start with, you know, releasing that. And that is how we get on this path to being able to support each other and support, support them in the process. So I feel like one side of the coin is, um, not allowing accepting it and the other side of the coin is use victim mentality using it as a scapegoat because i have this right mm-hmm. so either do you hold space for those people the same sort of way or how can you actually interact with them if that's kind of where they're at yeah so i can tell you for me i actually do not at least in the like i i don't have a lot of experience with that just because i can tell you i don't have a lot of patience for stuff like that i don't have a lot of patience for people who do not take accountability and will blame other people and feel like everything's against them and they're a victim but i also do have i feel for them i feel for them because they're like that from a source of pain they have something that has happened to them to make them feel like I, I need to use this as as an excuse. I need to use bipolar as an excuse. So something, there's something underneath that, but, and I understand that, but I know for me, I just, I know if I go back to that, that person that I was, I was like that for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I know that I needed to really change so much in my life. So I see it. I know there's pain behind it, but I also know you know, unless that person is going to take accountability and say, yes, like I've experienced all these terrible things. I feel like I'm at the end. I feel like nothing is going well. I feel like nothing's working, but what can we do about it? Like, what are the things we can control? So it's basically a mindset shift and really just kind of shifting that into like, what can I do today to have a better tomorrow? And knowing that there's resources and options, because I mean, I know what it's like to feel like stuck, to feel crippled. And I know I felt that way. And I'm, st- I'm probably going to feel that I know I'm going to feel that way again. Right. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's just really having the insight. And a lot of times people like that don't, cause I know I did not, I did not have awareness into it. I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't. So yeah. And, and then you mentioned, I think it was a friend or something and her mom has bipolar and she, she was saying, oh, it's because of my bipolar. What would you give as a recommendation for like someone in a situation like that, the friend of how to hold space for the mom or whoever it is in that situation? Yeah. So I would say as well, like, I think also it goes both ways. Like if, if that is your mom and she's saying that and like, and it's, it's hurtful for you because you're trying to have a relationship and she's saying, well, I can't be this or this way because I have bipolar or this, this happened like, like constantly kind of like throwing it back in your face in a way I would like for me, I mean, I would be honest with the person, right? I would be honest with my mom if living with bipolar and I would say, Hey, like I, you know, basically I understand if you do don't say you understand if you don't. Right. But if you do say, I understand how you're feeling. I know like what, what this is, how this is coming up for you, but I feel like you using this as an excuse is hurting you. It's actually hurting you and it's, it's keeping you stuck. So let's try to work on it together. But also to be honest with you, it does come down to that person being willing to understand that, to see that and to say, you know what? I, I don't want to be like this anymore. I don't want to think this way anymore. And I want to free myself of this. So if that person is unwilling to do that, if they don't think they can, or they need to, then I would say, you know, you don't need to, to maintain that relationship because you don't want to have people in your life that are hurting you, that are stressful, that are toxic, that are unwilling to do the work. So again, like it, again, it comes down to, we are all people here, right? Regardless of living with bipolar or not, especially if we're living with bipolar, we need to give ourselves grace and be kind to ourselves, but to use it as an excuse and to throw it in people's face and to, and to, you are doing that to yourself. You know, you you are creating that for yourself. So you need to be aware of that. And then also want to move out of it. Cause there's a lot of people who don't, like, I can tell you, I, I can tell you, I have met like a long time ago. I've met, I was, there was like the there's like a Facebook support group, like, like a long time ago that I was in. And it was a lot of people living with bipolar and a, and a lot of it was like very negative. 
of people complaining. I hate this person. I hate, you know, I hate, you know, none of this medicine works for me. Like, I don't like, and it was a lot of just bashing on stuff. And I was like, why don't, like, I just was like, I just want to work. I just want to find solutions. Cause it was actually making yeah. me really sad. It was making me really, really sad. And it was making me lose hope in a lot of things. So honestly, again, goes back to your environment and holding, you can, you know, be willing. And if, if you're able to hold space for that person, but also like, you do not need to continue to have that relationship with that person. If they are being abusive to you, if they are being unwilling to do the work and you know, you can try to get them help and resources, but you do not need to feel like it's your responsibility because again, it's that person, the responsibility to take accountability for what they can do for themselves and also what they can't. For sure. And this is where the show gets a little woo and esoteric, the fun stuff, but you know, <laughs> we are all energetic beings. And to your point, it can be as simple as being in a Facebook group with all this dense negativity, or maybe it's the news and everything that's going mm -hmm. on in the world and how, and how that makes us feel. All of a sudden we feel that, right? The yeah. same can work on the opposite side where we can be a vibrational match or with these people. And a section I wrote in one of my books is called uh, Patience with Relationships. And I, I don't know, uh, that book came out a couple of years ago, so I'm not sure it made it entirely in that section other than the concept of having patience. But the mm -hmm. other side is being an energetic, not match for them, but embodying what you want to be. Because after a while, you know, if this is a one-on-one -on -one situation, as opposed to like a Facebook group where you're going to have a ton of trolls, <laughs> right? But oh, yeah. a one-on-one -on -one situation, <laughs> you can be that embodiment and then they can kind of come meet you where you're at anyways though paris this has been incredible i appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge your experience your story with us here at the soul seeker podcast let everyone know where they can find you and your book uh, crooked illness and your podcast live well with bipolar yeah, Sam, thank you so much. I love this conversation and you guys can stay in touch with me. My website is parisscoby.com. I also have my Instagram and it's paris.scoby and then my live well bipolar Instagram as well. And basically everything's on my website. So the book, the podcast, and then the free bipolar wellness workbook is in the show notes. And then I can also link in the show notes as well, the episode where I interviewed my husband as well. So yeah, so I'd love to stay connected with you guys. And Sam, it's been amazing. I can't wait for um, just continued conversation. I, I loved doing this with you and I will, I'm thankful that we got to got time to do it. So awesome. It was so much fun. Same here. Thanks so much, Paris. Of course.